In the past eight lectures, we've looked at four categories of artificial intelligence machines. The rule-based, the supervised learning, the unsupervised learning, and human-machine interaction. And we also looked at possible future machines that AI researchers are working to build. And we've come to a transition point in our course here. We're now the next seven lectures. We're going to look at important application areas for artificial intelligence and see what's been accomplished. And today we're going to start that with data science. You have probably already noticed that the existing machines require a lot of data to train them and make them work. Expert systems, for example, can easily have a million rules in their database. Image classifiers might need 10 million images to train them. And game machines might need to play 100 million simulated games to learn how to beat humans. It's only been in recent years that we've had the sensors and the storage capabilities to gather and hold that much data. And also, at the same time, to the computing power to process those data into the learning function of a machine. But there's a big problem with all of this, the problem of trust. How can we trust that the data we're using to train our machines is, is good data? Where do we get 10 million labeled images from? Who labels the images? How do we know that the labelers have the required expertise to make the proper labels. We also know that biases in the training data are likely to show up as biases in the function of the machine after it's trained. Is there anything we can do to remove the bias? We talked about unsupervised learning and we saw there that uh, they try and get around some of this trust issue with the data by not relying on external training, but instead just on the data themselves. Thirty years ago, one of my colleagues, Peter Cheeseman, invented a program called AutoClass, Automatic Classification, that grouped data into similarity classes and without using any external input other than the data. Peter put it to the test by classifying the 5,400 objects detected by the NASA Infrared Sky Telescope Survey. Autoclass found exactly the classes already known to the astronomers, plus one new class. So it not only agreed with the expertise of the astronomers, it made a new discovery. Autoclass relied on an advanced statistical method called Bayesian learning. What else can we learn from advanced statistical methods that could do for us. It's answering questions like these, uh, trusting the data sets, using them to train machines, evaluating the reliability of the results, extracting patterns, employing advanced statistical methods, and building models. All these are questions that data science focuses on. Today's speaker is Major Ross Shushard of the U.S. Army. He has degrees in economics and social science, and he just got his Ph.D. from George Mason University. Congratulations. He was an Army aviation officer for seven years and an operations research officer for eight. He established the first data science cell at the Army Cyber Command and worked recently on data science within the DOD's new Army Futures Command. He just arrived at NPS this quarter and is now teaching classes. He told me that he's already taught three classes today, so maybe some of you already have heard from him already today. So we, uh, he's a member also of the Data Science Advisory Group. So please welcome Major Sutard. Thanks, Dr. Denning. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, to the uh, OR students, I uh, apologize for you having to listen to me for, for another hour. Uh, but it's data science, so it's a really exciting topic for me. Okay. Uh, so like Dr. Denning said, I've, uh, I'm ex really excited to be here to 
not only inform you what data science is to me, but uh, to share my experiences as not only an Army officer, but uh, a data scientist within DOD and what that currently means uh, in our environment. Um, so just like this course is exposing us to AI and uh, sort of serving as uh, an informational gap to uh, uh, per se put, to, put away some uh, myths and to place it in context, uh, hopefully we can serve uh, this uh, lecture today as well with data science. Because um, in the context of AI, uh, when we talked uh, about uh, the unsupervised and supervised learning models, data is key to all of those. Okay? So it's the essential foundation for these algorithms to be used. And in today's environment where data is ubiquitous, whether it's through internet technologies producing data, the digital exhaust that we're creating, whether it's from the devices we carry around or our online actions, uh, they're there for the use and data science serves as an application to not only acquire that data, but to essentially do something with it. And that something with it is what we'll talk about today. Um, and uh, precisely that's the modeling aspects of what data science seeks to do. So uh, we sit at that crux between getting data, what to do with it, finding it in a model and bringing those together and making sense of it. And more importantly, are we using it in the right context? So what I'm gonna talk about today is, I'm just gonna lay out a basic understanding of what is data science. Okay? And all data science works, work follows some sort of uh, uh, particular path or workflow. Okay? So it's an evolving, an evolving field, and with that, the precise definitions for them are evolving as well. Hence why I say generic in, in some of these instances. And then we're gonna focus a little bit on data science and DOD uh, specifically, both from the perspective of applications of data science to date and where we're going, and also the educational uh, piece of how we have to build a workforce that can account for data science work that needs to be done. And, uh, and w whether it's DOD or uh, a public entity or a private entity, uh, it's, it really comes down to all about uh, the data and what you have and, and what you can do with it. Okay? And we'll conclude with a, a cautionary warning. Okay? Um, so we don't want to overhype things. We don't want to set the stage that it's an end-all, be-all solution to things, but it's, it's a kit within the tool bag for decision makers to inform their decisions. And so we want to we seek that, uh, that answer and that clarity. Uh, and whether or not you're a data scientist, or you're a person in uniform or you're a civilian with DOD, data is all around us. You need to know what data science is and what it potentially can do for you and how to rely on your data scientists and the data science process, but also understanding and knowing its limitations are, are essentially a, a, is a big, bigger part of the problem as well or issue. And then if we have time, uh, we'll, we'll work into some questions as well. So, uh, Couple chuckles already. So 2012, uh, this article was released in Harvard Business Review. Okay. Um, I should say by trade, I'm an operations researcher. In the Army, it's called an FA-49. Um, my training has been primarily in computer science and, and uh, statistically driven economics. Okay. Uh, in DOD land, uh, it's really hard to explain uh, uh, those terms to folks. Uh, the advent of this article made it quite easy. We just started saying we're data scientists. And folks are like, oh, great, we understand what that is. Well, do we? Uh, just because we see it plastered all over the place and in dialogue and in, in uh, context of news articles, and uh, it's sort of become a ubiquitous term, uh, similar to the threat of perhaps say, AI. Okay? Um, but the idea that uh, it has this connotation of the sexiest job of the 21st century uh, sort of uh, led to a lot of uh, potentially overhyping of it uh, up front. Um, this is from Katie Nuggets uh, last year. Um, the idea of, of what we learned to date in machines and automation being that, well, if we can train a model to think and act like a human, well, potentially a data scientist will put themselves out of a job. And uh, 
that might be a, a bit down the road or a bit uh, 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 off uh, or not capable, but uh, something uh, that, that we need to address. Okay. So uh, what is data science? Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll explore a definition, uh, and I don't want to say explicitly define, as data science, uh, you won't find in a curriculum, you won't find in uh, a myriad of books or articles, you won't si uh, find an explicit definition that relates across the all, but they all have essential components. And primarily that we will study the analysis of data, and we will focus on building models from that data that accurately and consistently predict the future. Okay. And it doesn't stop there. So it's a continuous process of revalidating those models based on the trustworthiness of data, because conditions change. Right? So if you develop that model and it becomes explicit enough for you to deliver, well, the world's a, world's a really complex place. And especially in the line of work uh, that we uh, focus on in DOD, things change, conditions change, data changes, technology changes. Uh, as, as you've discovered in the first couple of weeks of this course, the, uh, uh, the advances of algorithms and the compute power gives us the power to do new things all the time. So this is a rapidly <coughs> evolving field, and we have to be able to account for those. So if we accept that broad definition of data science, um, uh, so where are we today, and what are the positive experiences we've, we've been able to accomplish so far? So we'll, we'll highlight a few of them, and some of them, uh, might uh, uh, resonate with you, some of them are obvious, some of them you might not even notice because it comes to you in a form of a user experience that you might not have realized. Right? So uh, we talked about uh, unsupervised uh, approaches to image recognition. Right? Uh, you can upload as many files or uh, image files as you want to a Google Photos uh, uh, folder. Right? You can put it on your iPhone, you can search by a person's face. Things we take for granted that if you back up five years ago uh, was very, very difficult to do. And the improving of that technology is, is quite obvious today. Here's one uh, that I hold near and dear to my heart is the idea of spam filtering your email. If you look to what Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo provided a couple years ago, you were receiving a deluge of spam content uh, within your inbox. Today, it, it's almost a non-issue, um, and it requires a dedicated effort of spammers to try to do that. And that's all taken away uh, based on the training of the models to detect and to classify incoming messages to your inbox. Recommender systems. Uh, folks that have a Netflix account, Folks had a Netflix account 10 years ago. A little older than someone here. Right? Uh, the recommender system has been revitalized multiple times in applications such as Netflix, to the point where the predictions for a certain entity within geographical regions actually makes somewhat sense. Uh, if you dig into the recommender system uh, uh, literature that Netflix provides to an extent, uh, they struggle when they go into new markets because they're trying to learn the habits of a new population to provide them the best recommendations. Okay. Predictive maintenance. This is something I've worked on uh, quite often. Former aviator. Um, the idea of predictive maintenance both in commercial entities and DOD is, is one, of the, one of the great uh, uh, opportunities that we have with advances in, uh, in data science and AI in general. In uh, previous iterations in, uh, in aircraft maintenance, we would go by blanket hour uh, limits. So what I mean by that is you get to 400 hours on an, a particular engine, and you have to pull that engine out, and you have to go through a diagnostic check, and that aircraft is down, and it's out of, of use for an operational platform. Okay. Now we've placed a bevy of sensors within and on that aircraft that read from that engine that allow us to take diagnostic tests 
in an iterative fashion over the lifespan of that engine. So it doesn't necessarily need to have to get to a, a, a dry hour limit uh, before it has to be pulled and brought down. So we're learning from that so we can re-baseline our uh, expectations of those uh, maintenance tasks. And uh, one very recent uh, uh, release uh, showed not only uh, an application for DOD, but highlights a very uh, uh, interesting relationship in a positive manner between a military entity and a commercial technology firm in the mil this military medicine uh, uh, program called RATE. And in this RATE program, uh, uh, which is run by DITRA Defense Threat Reduction Agency, they collaborated through the Defense Innovation Unit with an, uh, a health AI company that takes over 150 uh, diagnostic points from a human body um, and uh, ascribes to be able to predict whether or not an individual is coming under a certain uh, health condition 48 hours prior to anything that would be noticeable from a clinical standpoint. And so think of that application as not only if you're a commander or an allocation of forces or you're just workforce. If you can figure out what is affecting your personnel, you can attend, potentially make those decisions to adjust and to modify the environment or to potentially isolate an individual or to see what's going on before uh, that would get out of control. Plus, you can also have better planning assumptions with that. So again, not an exhaustive list, but very positive advances, very tangible results, things that are very, 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 very important to an organization for gaining efficiency, for using data, for learning from, uh, that have uh, sort of put data science on a sort of pedestal of what can be accomplished. So how do we conduct data science? And uh, again, you can look at, into many curricula, uh, many uh, data science self-help books, uh, coding books, uh, lectures, and uh, you'll see a different workflow or process diagram of how to do this. Um, but essentially, I'm going to distill it down to some primary components for us. But the first thing is, you don't just jump into a data science problem, and you just don't go grab a bunch of data and just hope that something emerges. You have to define the problem. And that's a, a, another way to say it is your stakeholder analysis. Who are you trying to solve a problem for? What is the scope of that problem? And what are those input and output requirements for it? And by input, we're saying, well, what are those data that we need to eventually inform that model that we want to run? And uh, reviewing back to some of the unsupervised and supervised techniques that you learned about prior, Data is key to, to uh, using those and to building those models and to validate them. So the question and the onset after defining your problem is, do we have access to it? Can we collect it? Can we store it? Do we have the expertise to do those things? And so that opens up a whole array of different uh, questions that you have to be able to answer for yourself. And once you get the data, well, guess what? The data is probably really, really, really ugly. Okay? For, for those of you that dealt in data problems, uh, you might not receive it in the way you get it. Uh, you can run a deep uh, neural net uh, example online in a tutorial that takes you know, 10 minutes because you're handed a clean data set. But uh, the reality of the systems that we deal with in DoD and in industry, are data doesn't come out that clean. And so you can spend a considerable amount of time in what we call data munging, which is preparing your data and cleaning it and making it uh, viable for that model that you're bringing it into. And then, once you have that data, you have access to it, you've cleaned it, you've prepared it, then we can get to the initiation and the development and the testing of that model. Now, Many times folks will want to focus on, well, I want to get to that model right away. And uh, they overestimate or underestimate the time required to go through that data process. And 
And that is exactly some of the issues and shortcomings that we've seen in AI in general and data science as well. Because uh, those expertise of the team that you have or the individuals might not line up with those to be able to inform those models. And once you're developing the model, coming up with that, taking that data to be able to train your model so you can eventually test it to deploy it to answer that specific question you have, that's when you're able to finally put it into a product that you can present back to that stakeholder. Okay? So at the end, once you present this, you need to go back and say, well, does that answer the problem that we set out to answer? Okay? And so I've arranged these in a sequential flow. Now, these items should happen in that order, but there also is iteration between and among each of those steps as well. You might spend a lot of time redefining that problem. You might spend a lot of time, especially in DoD, trying to get access to that data because of bureaucracy or the ability to get it and to be able to traverse it over a network and, uh, and so forth. Okay? So uh, it could take many, many uh, iterations for this. And, and again, as I opened with, even when you get that final model, it becomes stale or it has a certain shelf life based on the conditions of the real world environment with it. So within that, it's, it's, more, it's also a question of, of how do you execute this in, in your organization and do you have the people to do it? Um, because there isn't a set standard way to do that for every single problem. And we've seen that to date in DOD. So uh, ex in exciting fashion, uh, the DOD is trying to get ahead of this, finally. And uh, we'll talk about uh, AI applications in DOD later on in the, in the course, but I just want to highlight a few entities where data science is prominent right now. And, uh, and these are, are very, 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 very important to setting the foundation for where we're going as a department. So the first one I want to point out is the, is the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, uh, known as the Jake, just recently established. And this, is, this organization has a tall order. So not only is it guiding the department's focus on AI projects, it's also seeking to coordinate or efforts throughout the department. So think of all the services and all the external components of that. And the engagement of DOD with technology firms. So just north of here in Silicon Valley, uh, and going back to uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, uh, there is a, an assumption or uh, a perception that DOD did not get along well with the Valley. Okay? So this, this is a deliberate effort to bring practitioners that exist both in DOD and within industry to come together to solve some of these very complex problems within data science. Now, with Within that construct, some of the services have come up with their own AI entities. Uh, in particular, and I don't mean to, uh, to highlight all ARMY stuff, but it's just what I'm, I'm used to and, and uh, uh, want to also highlight to make uh, folks aware, but the ARMY AI task force just stood up at Carnegie Mellon. So it's not located in the Pentagon. It's not located on a base, a post-camp station. It's located at Carnegie Mellon, with, uh, aligned with the robotics uh, uh, department there as, as well so that they can reach out to not only the experts at Carnegie Mellon, but to learn from them and reach out to the entity at large throughout. And uh, just highlight another one, Four Star Command, uh, Special Operations Command, uh, just uh, uh, cut the ribbon on their data engineering lab that is also uh, working in concert with these. Uh, one initial project for all these is lining together the modern, modernization priorities and uh, ma uh, a predictive maintenance of the UH-60 fleet is one of the common uh, pieces through there. But even here at uh, MPS, we have our data science and analytics group uh, called DSAG. And it actually predates these organizations. Um, and this entity here is a multi multidisciplinary team of, of uh, researchers that uh, have interest in data science and the application of that. And uh, some of the basic functionality is uh, uh, spreading the awareness throughout DOD, advising and insisting, uh, assisting on projects, uh, data science projects, and, and building those models for folks and advising them uh, for it. Okay. So uh, you know, just to highlight a few, and we're going to see more of these, but th the great thing is there's an attempt now to take the 
data science efforts that were happening in isolation to bring them into a, uh, a larger consortium of, of, uh, of entities that are under the guidance of some larger organizational construct. And so to conduct data science, we also need a workforce for it. And we're seeing the rapid changes in this as well. And so at MPS uh, right now, we've changed our curriculum to provide uh, data science driven courses. And we've actually modified them uh, a few times in the, in the first few years of their existence based on how technology is changing and how the customer throughout DOD wants to see their data scientists coming out of the program. A uh, similar uh, effort uh, is ongoing at uh, Air Force Institute of Technology as well in Dayton, Ohio, uh, a deliberate program to produce a certificate in data science to expose students uh, to this. Um, and as well as uh, a DOD uh, spending uh, uh, or changing uh, their uh, advanced civil schooling of sending folks to graduate institutions that are focusing on, uh, on the development of data science curriculum. But you don't have to go to formal uh, education of two year in resident courses for this because we're offering a multitude of short course instruction and uh, essentially MOOC uh, based uh, uh, work as well. And part of this is just sharing the story of the efforts that are going on uh, within DOD. And uh, for, for uh, an in, in, uh, example from the Army, uh, the Army has actually uh, implemented a skill identifier saying these folks are actually data scientists with uh, the announcement of the R1J uh, this past uh, spring. So that's what's going on in DOD. And where we're going from ed education and development perspective, um, I want to transition the rest of the brief now to sort of that cautionary tale and, and, uh, and uh, where there are limitations that must be known in, in these applications that we're developing. Okay. Uh, so right here, the title of the slide says Jaywalking Billionaire. And I don't know if you can see, because uh, it's, it's from a traffic cam photo. But this is a facial recognition in uh, China uh, last year. And the person's face is on the side of the bus, uh, was considered in an automated attempt of finding jaywalkers, uh, was actually cited uh, for attempting to jaywalk. The funny thing was that uh, this individual is a multi-billionaire that, that uh, runs an air conditioning and manufacturing conglomerate. So it became uh, big news and uh, sort of alerted folks as to the limitation of some of these uh, technologies that were being used at the time. Um, it, you know, these, are, these are not infallible systems. Okay? Um, but at the same time, the attempts that are going on are improving rapidly, but we need to understand their limitations. And so when we go back to saying it's all about the data, I want to talk about three uh, specific areas of establishing trust in data and something that we should all be aware of, whether you're a data scientist or not, but just general knowledge is needed. The first one's selection bias. So we say we, we need an incredible amount of data to inform these models. Well, at some point, you may need to make that, that uh, determination of the data that you're going to collect and you're going to store and you're going to munge to create your model. Okay? Um, but we induce biases along the way, uh, whether intentional or not. And we just need to be aware of those, especially when we go back to validate our models. Um, and the idea of, of selection bias, um, it can simply be boiled down to, well, do we not have the right data? Or not knowing whether or not you, uh, you have the wrong data. Okay? And uh, a couple examples of where this comes out is, is, is really, do you have the right data for the problem that you're trying to answer? The first, uh, one of the first problems I worked on, on at U.S. Army Cyber Command was uh, 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 in a unit had been looking at log files. And uh, they had hired a contractor to come in to perform data science work for them. And the data science work took about a week. And they came back with a, a model presented uh, to, the, to this organization. And, uh, the uh, individual briefing said, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. This machine right here is causing all of your problems. Well, the problem was they took a supervised classification model that was looking at anomaly detection across an entire network, but applied it to what was called
called host-based data, uh, which is just data that happens locally on a system and fires off some responses. And the, the epicenter of their network diagram they're showing was one system that had all of the faults or the flags that were going off in this entity because the machine kept calling itself because the user had locked out their password and it kept firing off multiple, multiple alerts over and over and over again. But again, it goes back to the context of the problem and they didn't have the right, they weren't applying the right piece to the right data uh, with it. Um, but it goes down to, you know, if something works in a specific scope, does it work in a general? And if you're going from specific to general, you have to account for those factors and that can be, uh, that can be pretty daunting and require more, uh, more work. And uh, in something as uh, a lot of folks will use in a synonymous term with data science and say, well, it's applied statistics. And that's part of the toolkit of a data scientist is, is learn, learn, learning and knowing how to use applied statistics. One of the things you learn as a statistician is, is uh, to be aware of Simpson's paradox. And uh, a, a couple of, uh, of instances to highlight with this is, there are many uh, areas where you can look in a very regional location or to uh, a very uh, distinct population where you can find statistics uh, that present a, a particular case. In, per, uh, in, a, in a couple of very popular examples, it's in hiring data where uh, certain uh, groups or uh, uh, whether it be uh, sex, uh, gender, or sex and gender, uh, different uh, racial uh, categories or ethnicities where they say, oh, these, these subpopulations are doing quite well. But when you bring it to the macro level, you actually see a reverse of those trends because the dilution in the macro perspective of the data uh, uh, overcomes those uh, 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 results that you found statistically proven in the, in the micro selection. Now in labeling bias, uh, we talked about labeling a lot uh, so far in the course. So I just wanna highlight a few different different uh, areas where this bias comes in. And, and uh, uh, folks uh, say, well, we have humans labeling data because we have to uh, put a human in the loop uh, to be able to equate those. Well, can we trust the humans that are doing that? And so in two specific examples I list here, we have a uh, multitude of stories of humans uh, trying to determine the sentiment of text even if it's not their uh, native language uh, and being able to provide that context. Okay. Um, Dr. Denning uh, talked about uh, the uh, polyp images uh, previously too, where we have non-trained medical uh, folks that are going through and circling uh, uh, polyps in medical uh, imagery to try to be able to take those results and feed them into a, a classification system, be able to determine the images for those. Okay. So, so there's a trade-off. Okay. Because at the end of the day, if we use automated machine labeling, it can be incredibly efficient. But at the same time, it can be uh, misused as well. Uh, for instance, you can read into uh, some off-the-shelf uh, technology, some data files, and they'll come up with your classifiers for you. Uh, but for something like a timestamp, if you have multiple timestamps in there, it could just, it'll just blindly take that in without the context. So, at the end of the day, there's, there's gotta be a trade-off between that in the loop or on the loop perspective of the human making that decision. And sometimes uh, some of the risks are much lower. So for classifying a picture for uh, a certain inclusion of you finding in your inbox versus classifying a, a picture for a, a target engagement, there are extreme differences in the trade-off of that risk. I wanna spend a, a couple minutes talking uh, uh, where that labeling issues come into play and some of the research that I've recently done involved with social bots. So uh, online platforms such as Twitter uh, is, have uh, come under assault from automated accounts, okay? So automated accounts aren't necessarily bad, uh, but they can in unintentionally be bad for a particular platform as well, because they can amplify a message that uh, 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 occurs at a rate much faster than humans can engage in dialogue. And that can uh, take uh, extreme points of view or flood messages and whatnot. And Twitter's, Twitter in particular, which I'll focus on, has struggled with that recently. That has given rise to many uh, attempts, uh, algorithmic attempts in the supervised and unsupervised space to automatically detect these uh, bots. Now, um, 
as bots uh, continue in their evolution towards from basic to uh, being more human-like, uh, research has caught or attempts to catch up to this, uh, to this uh, transformation of, uh, of these algorithms. While there's much focus on the detection, not much focus has gone into the analysis of it. So we take as ground truth what these algorithms are putting out to say, oh, well, this storyline or this narrative has X number of bots because this detection uh, uh, algorithm told us that. Well, in, in specific cases, that, that's not necessarily the best solution. So Pew uh, uh, themselves has released many studies where they say, X percentage of, of storyline of an election or gun control debate have bots in them. Well, a specific type of bot because it uses a specific type of detection algorithm because they're as diverse, the bots can be as diverse as the humans that create them. Okay? So uh, DARPA has uh, spent a considerable amount of time trying to look at the bot detection themselves and have come away with, well, Maybe it's so complex that we have to have a semi-supervised approach with the human uh, within that loop to verify this. And that's part of uh, uh, the challenge associated with, with many of these things. So obviously this is important for many, uh, many reasons. Uh, you know, the growing sophistication of, uh, and the use of, of web-based technologies and, and platforms to get your news has shown that some things can be affected, whether it's from uh, recent protests in Hong Kong to the actual Brexit campaign has been uh, affected by bots and, and well documented. But I will show you in, in, uh, in this uh, overall results of trying to bring together an ensemble detection methodology where I spent a lot of time trying to bring together uh, different uh, detection algorithms to show what the uh, potential overlap or the intersection of results can be, and that it's incredibly difficult. Uh, so this upset diagram on, uh, on your left uh, uh, is, is, might be a little hard to decipher from your, your perspective, but the, the crux and the, the takeaway from this is we have potentially over 100,000 over 100, bots detected in specific detection algorithms, but when you bring them all together, the overlap of them actually uh, is diluted uh, quite significantly, that when you look at just two, you're already ordered magnitude down, that when you use all three, in this instance, instance of a same conversation, <coughs> you're down to just eight. And this is in the context of over 40 million tweets that I looked at. So you have to be able to put your classification results into perspective uh, for that. And so we talked about selection bias, and we talked about labeling bias. So even if you get your model correct and your data is strong and you validate your data, you still have to be able to explain what happened. And again, it's a continuum spectrum of where you can take risk, but uh, many times if, you're, if your recommender system or your detection classification uh, presents to you something that either doesn't make sense or you just receive it as truth, well, that's, that, that can be problematic for a, a myriad of reasons. And uh, the case with these are that, especially when we get into the unsupervised uh, world, it is really hard to place in context what is happening in some of these black box algorithms. Okay? And uh, blindly trusting the output is, is problematic. So, this diagram right here is from the uh, explainable AI program at DARPA where uh, there's an incredible attempt going on right now to revise many machine learning processes by putting in uh, basically what is a, a reset foundation of what a computational problem is. So we should be able to explain what our inputs are so that we can better understand our outputs, but also put the constraints and uh, better understanding of what the system is to say, how long are these results valid? If I will get an error if these things occur, and here's a cycle where it needs to be updated at. And this is a foundational shift because, especially uh, when we get to the perspective of using uh, AI when we're making decisions about people and their well-being, uh, we should be able to put that in context and understand what is going on. 
And so this will be a very important effort to not only uh, follow from the DARPA perspective, but to see what comes out of that and, uh, and if uh, we can get the explainability process down in, in uh, industry as well. Now, we talked before about some, uh, some uh, positive cases of data science. Um, has anybody heard of uh, Google Flu Trends before? I actually sat in a, a, a coding class a few years ago where this was the exemplar example of what positive data, data science is. Uh, the background of this is Google in 2008 launched uh, a research team that looked into the search patterns uh, on its search engine and uh, wanted to see if they could detect whether or not certain search parameters were indicative of conditions that would uh, emerge later. And in uh, particular, this inst instance was if they could come up with a set list of terms related to the influenza uh, strain or flu uh, like symptoms, they might be able to predict uh, based on the location of the queries of populations where the spread of the flu might take place. So, this uh, ongoing study uh, was quite effective up front, or so it seemed to appear, uh, to the point where they actually had a, uh, an article published in Nature with thousands of citations. If you get a paper in Nature, that's a big deal. Um, and this became a, sort of the, the, the gold standard of what we can do from humans as sensors collaborating. Um, and uh, claims such as 97% accuracy rate and is two weeks ahead of, of reporting time frames that we're going to uh, the CDC, so this could be a, a tipping point to know where to put resources and uh, where uh, uh, you know, medical intervention was needed. And uh, you know, great storyline. Problem was in 2013 when we had uh, severe outbreaks across the US in the flu that were sort of unprecedented, uh, there was so much traffic and searches on the flu of how many folks have the flu, where's the flu spreading, that it actually altered the search algorithm results that it induced the uh, Google, uh, Google flu trends uh, model to throw it off by upwards of 140% uh, at a time when it was needed the most. And uh, that led to a whole litany of other papers of saying why this is wrong. Right? So then we go on the other spectrum where this idea of data science hubris emerged uh, from this episode of saying, well, Big data game through uh, insights, game through data science is not all it's meant to be. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, they learned a lot from it and Google went back and changed it and with the help of ac and some academic research partners, they changed their model, they updated, they learned from it, all from the concept that it needs to be an iterative approach. So uh, taking a, a binary uh, uh, success failure is not a way to look at these right now as we continue to develop these capabilities. But um, I, we'll conclude as, with a cautionary warning. Um, and so in DOD and, and beyond DOD, uh, we continue to make vast, vast investments in both personnel and uh, uh, technologies uh, uh, to employ data science uh, uh, within uh, not only our applications, but uh, developing a workforce that is complementary uh, to what industry is doing. Okay? But the caution is we're also in the early stages of many of these efforts and uh, as we continue to rapidly evolve, expectations need to be kept in check because for a lot of these, we're just seeing ourselves for the first time. Okay? So there's this uh, allure to go focus on this uh, uh, you know, new emergent algorithm that has a predictive power or nature to it, but Right now, in some of the organizations you're gonna to go to, seeing yourselves might be that step that you only get to in that workflow. And that might, that's okay, okay? Because if we don't get those right, we're not gonna be able to proceed past that. But at the same time, we know that these models are developed on data from the past. And if we're gonna use them for prediction, we have to make some sort of forecast of what we think the parameters for tuning these models will be in the future. Um, and if we, solve our data problem and we have confidence in our data, 
we have to make sure we're prepared for what that means. And we just uh, need to know that we might not get there overnight. We're not going to get there overnight. And uh, it's a highly uncertain process of forecasting things that happen in the future. We can't account for all contingencies and the complexity of human actors and the environment uh, that they act in. Right? So there has to be the caveat known on that uh, so that we aren't surprised by those results when we don't get them. Because at the end of the day, we can have a validated model, but it might still be a, a poor predictor of what, what is to come. Okay. So don't mean to end on a sour note with it, but it's the idea that you know, you're all going to be involved with data science in one way or another. Whether you're a leader of an organization or uh, you end up uh, getting into the data science field. Know that there are limitations, but it's a team sport. It just can't be one individual within an organization driving it. It's a culture change, and it requires everyone to be part of it for that iteration. And uh, it is ex it's very exciting times, and you're going to learn about more applications as, the, uh, as this course goes on of uh, different applications of AI. But uh, data science serves as, as a centerpiece for a lot of those. And with that, uh, happy to take any questions for any time that we might have remaining.